Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let's call tonight's meeting to order and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It hasn't Let's begin with public audience. Joan. Okay, so we're going to hear more about it. Joan Coe, 26 Whitman Drive. The Board of Selectmen has received a letter questioning the objectivity of town manager Maria Capriola detailing allegations supporting the position. There have been several union complaints filed with the union and copied to the town manager, Maria Capriola. These complaints are available under the Freedom of Information Act, available to the public and the Board of Selectmen. A manager can lead by trust, respect, or fear, leading to abuse of power. When there are allegations of abuse of power against the town manager, the Board of Selectmen should take notice. The Board of Selectmen is given the authority to hire and terminate a town manager. Town Manager Maria Capriola has initiated an internal investigation with the town labor attorney interrogating town staff for hours. It is alleged that the internal investigation is complete. It is alleged that the labor attorney was not interested in fact-finding but used intimidation in his interrogating of staff. All internal investigations are available under the Freedom of Information Act. A conditional offer of employment was given to the code compliance officer who was employed by the town of Mansfield. This is a full-time, non-exempt position with 35 hours work week, including a one-hour unpaid lunch. The employee will accrue vacation at a rate of 1.25 days for each month of service. That's according to the contract. The code compliance officer started employment on April 16, 2019 at step four with three weeks vacation and is no longer an employee of the town, but will start employment at another job on September 30th, 2019. The Board of Selectmen should initiate their own investigation into the allegations set forth in the union complaints. Our town employees should not be subjected to a toxic work environment. Recently, Chief Bolter gave both Sergeant Trumley and Sergeant Corcoran reprimands for, quote, negligent, uh, neglect of duty, intimidation, lack of thoughtfulness and attentiveness to your duties and failure to adequately perform your duties, end quote. Both officers have over 10 years of experience without any disciplinary action and have the confidence of their fellow officers. Both these officers were on the midnight shift without any issues. Many of the officers are alleging that this is retaliatory for questioning authority. Both grievances are presently in arbitration. It is alleged that Chief Bolter has initiated internal investigations on both Sergeant Trumley and Sergeant Corcoran. Sergeant Trumley has been suspended with pay, possibly leading to termination. All the internal investigations, when completed, are public information. On September 18, 2019, I filed a Freedom of Information complaint with Chief Bolter to review all internal investigations from January 2019 to the present. It is alleged that Mark Rustic, supervisor of the building and grounds, has been on medical leave since August 16, 2019. It is alleged it was alcohol or drug related. The Board of Finance recently received a request from the Simsbury Performing Arts Center PAC for an appropriation of $100,000 for a fence surrounding the Simsbury Meadows Park. The submission states, quote, staff is requesting an additional appropriation of $100,000 for fencing at the bandshell. This project was included in the fiscal year 2021 of the six-year CNR plan. This year, staff has received numerous concerns from the public impact regarding safety, security, and aesthetics issues related to temporary fencing installed annually. If we were able to make funds available now for fiscal year 1920, we would be able to construct the permanent fence in advance of the PAC's 2020 season and alleviate the fencing issue approximately one year ahead of time ahead of schedule, end quote. This appears to be a sweetheart deal between town manager Maria Caparoli and Missy DeNuno, the manager of the PAC. The PAC is a private organization using our park and should not use taxpayer money to erect a permanent fence to control the collection of money for PAC events. Simsbury would be the first town that installs permanent, a permanent fence around a public park. Linda Schofield is a member of the Board of Finance and is president of PAC. There was no discussion about approving the use of funds being used. 
that was not budgeted, which is against their concerns. Lesser requests for funding have been rejected. Giving $100,000 to a private organization, the PAC, without any discussion appears to be suspect. The Board of Selectmen should reject the request from the PAC and remove the ugly green fencing around Simsbury Meadows Park. If the PAC cannot control the entrance, they should look for another property that meets their needs. The Recreation Department has initiated a master plan survey for Simsbury Farms. This, what was omitted from the survey was the golf course. With a loss of 495292 in revenue from the Simsbury Farms Special Revenue Fund, why isn't the golf course part of the discussion? And pickleball court should be included in this discussion. All of my comments will be posted on Simsbury Patch, Twitter, and Joan Co. and newsfeed on Facebook. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joan. Would anyone else like to speak in public audience tonight? Yes, Maura. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Maura Fitzgerald, 27 Castlewood Road resident of Simsbury for the past uh, 25 years. Um, I'm a representative of uh, the Gifts of Love. I'm a board chairman. And uh, what I'm here tonight is going to reflect the comments and the opinions and the facts uh, of Gifts of Love Board of Directors. So good evening, Board of Selectmen and guests. I want to give, begin with the history of Gifts of Love and the community farm of Simsbury. We've been good stewards of the farm since the merger in 2013. When Gifts of Love merged with the farm, we quickly discovered there was a significant amount of debt. And since then, that debt has been taken care of through grants, foundations, private donations, and funders. In the past six years, we've been able to secure funding that has significantly improved and increased the value of the property which we lease today. We have added three high tunnels, a greenhouse, solar power, a pavilion with fencing, uh, excuse me, a pavilion with cement flooring. We've added three high tunnels, um, uh, uh, cement flooring and a new floor in the educational building, a new floor in the lower level of the barn, and multiple walk-in refrigeration coolers. This is in addition to the overall beautification that we have done to the property in general. We are grateful for the ongoing support of the Boy Scouts. They've been true supporters of the organization, and over the past few years, they have added bridges, walkways to view and study the various ecosystems that exist on the farm. A fire pit, an additional outdoor workspace beside the greenhouse, and many other various projects um, have been completed by the Boy Scouts. They intend to use the farm this past weekend, as they did, um, to park cars dur during the Simsbury fly-in. They will also be having a sleep out on the farm on October 5th and plan selling holiday wreaths in the December time frame on the farm. We've been, we have been privileged to work with children, adults, and families from a variety of communities, and we are dedicated to continuing the share of the property and its structures. Multiple organizations have expressed a desire to work with Gifts of Love, and we look forward to continuing our ability to provide vocational and educational programs. Our goal is we will continue our stewardship, stewardship to maintain the farm and to grow and develop new educational programs. We especially look forward to continuing to grow certified organic produce for the Simsbury Social Services, the families in need who use Gifts of Love food pantries and to other organizations who continue to need our support. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for public audience tonight? Okay. Um, then we'll move on to uh, our presentation tonight. Uh, we'll begin with a, a presentation on the Kearns Community Project. It's a, a proposed project to convert a former elementary school in Granby into a shared community space that would be open to residents of multiple towns, including Simsbury. Um, this would be near the Simsbury-Granby border, um, right pretty much across the street from where the stop and shop is located. Alicia Newton is going to uh, be doing the presentation, so I'll just ask her to come up to the podium. Thank you. Uh, Elliot Baltimore with me as well. Great. Thanks, Elliot. Hi. How are you doing? Sure. Yeah. Lovely. Let me just hit the arrow. Thank you very much for having us. Um, we're excited to share this project with you and to let you know about the opportunities that will be available. Um, Curtin's Community Center, I am 
on the board of directors. I'm Alicia Newton, and this is our um, executive director, Kelly Altmer. So the community center idea came out from a couple conversations. We were working with Resilience Grows Here, which does veterans uh, mental health trauma support, as well as military families, um, and a lot of work in the school systems, working with children on trauma and resilience. Resilience Grows Here was saying that it would be really powerful if they had their own space um, where veterans could like claim the space as their own, and it wasn't a place that didn't like further isolate the veterans. Um, Granby Youth Services, I was having conversations with the director there who was wishing there was a specific youth services building, which Granby actually used to have and is now the animal control shelter. Um, they're using the senior center, which is great, and when their teens are done <coughs> using it, it has to look like it's teens have never been there, which is difficult. Um, <laughs> and then Nourish My Soul does food programming and uh, youth education and Alicia's driving all of her stuff around in a tiny car that's packed to the brim with like, you know, child safe knives and adult <laughs> knives and um, was talking about how nice it would be if there was a space specific for, you know, a commercial kitchen where we could do teaching, programming, uh, allow people to start businesses out of. And every one of those programs works to address this crisis of isolation that we're all feeling. Um, their Americans are lonelier than they've ever been. Uh, like 20 years ago, when you asked Americans how many close friends they had, they said four. Uh, now the most common answer is zero. So like, even though we're astonishingly connected online, our meaningful connections and our ways of being a part of a civic fabric of our community aren't there anymore. So we have uh, more square footage in our homes than we ever have before. We're lonelier than we ever have before. And the impact is far-reaching. Uh, lonely people have the same, like, hormone cortisol in their body as if a stranger walked up and punched you in the face, except it's normalized. We're living, our loneliness is killing us. You're three times more likely to die in any given year if you say you have zero close friends. Um, a study just came out of London that showed a lot of seniors will go an entire week without talking to people. And those are, you know, that's not just London, that's here too. And so everything we're trying to do is how do we take all the people who are active or want to be active in our community and provide a space where all of the things that are already happen can continue to happen and feed off and build on each other. And the Kearns community, or the Kearns school is a 40,000 square foot building that closed down three years ago that's in remarkably good condition. Um, well, Elliot already touched on a lot of Sorry. this. <laughs> <laughs> Who's feeling isolated? Um, oh. um, we have, our veterans have expressed severe isolation, um, senior citizens, a lot of them um, are losing those groups that they used to belong to, are homebound or they have a caretaker who's unable to bring them places during the day. Um, teens and middle schoolers, I work a lot in the schools and that is one of the number one complaints that we're hearing. They're very connected on social media, way more than they should be, but in terms of the one-on-one -on -one personal interactions, they're really not having them anymore. Um, they're feeling very isolated stay-at-home moms we're hearing that from, you know, middle-aged men, the 20-something generation, you know, they're getting out of college and, you know, they don't have those close friendships and things to do. Parents of kids with special needs are really feeling that. There's very little for them to participate in mainstream with their children. Um, and then the caregivers for uh, family members with dementia. Really, it's who isn't feeling isolated right now. I think we all can relate to this in some, some way. So the vision is that Kearns Community Center would be an intergenerational space that fosters healthy relationships while engaging us in the work of caring for our community. And again, it came from uh, three existing like initiatives and programs that were already happening. The conversations we've continued to have are with programmings that are already happening. And it's about how can we support and uplift what you're doing? What kind of space would you need made available to like fully realize your dream or a mission you haven't been able to yet? Um, and what could we do that's not duplicating existing efforts? Yep, great. <laughs> <laughs> so we created the, um, our mission statement early on, which is Kearns Community Center empowers people to build lasting relationships, strengthen their communities, and share their gifts. So we've had uh, a billion conversations in the past year and a half. So this project started in January of 2018. Um, and for the first six months, all we did was go around to 
different, you know, like youth services in different towns and senior centers and the Y and Parks and Rec um, and uh, 4-H and robotics, all the different groups that we know are already doing really powerful work and said, we're thinking about starting a shared community center. Um, the Kern School is open, you know, initially we were thinking we would have some use something much smaller, but Kearns is at least right now available. And so the conversations we had were, if we did this, what would you be afraid of us doing? And what would you want us to do? So from the beginning, recognizing that this couldn't like bring fear into people if they thought we were gonna take away from what they were doing and naming that really upfront. So what are you afraid of us doing? We'll make sure we don't. And then what would you like to do with us or what could we do to uplift what you're already doing? And that's where everything that we have now came from was those conversations. And those conversations are continuing, though the number of people that we haven't talked to is much smaller than it was a year and a half ago. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> do you want to? Okay. Um, this is all online on our website. And so uh, I'll give a quick rundown. Um, some of the stuff in here is new. Uh, for instance, a veteran space, an adult daycare that specializes in people with dementia or early onset Alzheimer's. Um, or the early, I should say, the early stages of Alzheimer's. That's new in our area. A uh, space that's specific for robotics that's not in the high school. The space is new, the program is not. Um, a communal wood shop where uh, people can come in and, and learn how to use a lathe or build furniture or build a birdhouse. Um, that's a new concept. The ones that are new for here are not new created out of the blue. So we're modeling off of existing insurance and safety practices from, you know, wood shops up and down the East Coast. When we talk about how do you uh, set up insurance that can have both childcare and senior centers, we're working with an insurance agent who has already established policies that cover that breadth of programming. So the things that are new for this region are not, are not new and untested, they're just new here. Um, some things aren't new. So um, the audio video recording studio that would be GCTV moving in to use that space. And then in addition, that space gets to be where people rent out podcasting or video recording booths. Um, the durable medical equipment rental closet, which I actually understand Simsbury is also starting, um, would be a really, you know, we've had conversations. I was just talking with someone, I think at the Rotary Club about the durable medical equipment closet mm -hmm. and about how this would be a really wonderful opportunity to partner and that it's okay that we won't have one of everything if we can figure out how to know what's around. Um, Co-working space, not a new idea, but a new expansion. The park, the community park is actually all inside. So there is some outdoor area, but outdoor area is, is wonderfully covered by everything that's already in this region. That's not, a, that's not a thing we're trying to do. We're trying to create a space for running around and getting out of the house when it's rainy or those four months out of the year when it's miserable or the increasing number of days in the summer when it's too hot to go outside. So we're modeling that off a park that's in East Hampton, Massachusetts. That's the closest one and there's more. Um, so that's, you know, a thousand foot putting green that when it's not used for putting, it gets turned into run around on space. That's picnic tables and swings and lawn games. One of the barriers to meeting our community needs to overcoming the hump of isolation is that it's hard to find a place you can go where you can hang out without um, spending money or drinking alcohol often the two of those and so this park gets to be a come with your children uh, the participants in the adult daycare center get to go and sit and get some passive socialization where they can be around people without having to interact in ways that are uncomfortable for them which has proven to be remarkably beneficial in slowing the progression of um, memory diseases Art's not new, but a new space that would just be like, yes, get paint on the floor, it's fine. And then the teaching kitchens and community cafe, uh, Nourish My Soul's gonna take over, so. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of, I, I do work with Resilience Grows Here with the Veteran Mental Health Initiative, and we have a lot of veterans that we work with that are looking to do startup businesses. You know, we help them grow things, like um, a lot of them have, there's one that has a salsa garden right now, um, Another one that loves growing all kinds of tomatoes and they've expressed an interest in being able to convert that into something that they can then sell. So having these commercial kitchens available for them and learning a business um, is a wonderful opportunity as well as opening it up to others, um, not just veterans. Teaching kitchens right now, like Elliot had mentioned, I am a traveling kitchen. I go to community centers all in the area and, and I teach young people um, how to grow food and then how to prepare it and then they share it with the community. So having a dedicated space 
would be wonderful. And we plan to accommodate up to 24 students at a time, um, and it will be handicap accessible. And that can also be broadcast through the GCTV, um, so then other people who are homebound can also be learning from this. Uh, Community Cafe is actually has been tested by our high school leadership program. They have been rescuing food from the waste stream for the past um, year and few months. And they then convert that food into commu free community meals. And they have to still turn away massive amounts of food. So the idea that they, the business plan that they came up with and they've partnered with One World Everybody Eats is that they will continue to rescue this food on a grand scale and convert that into community meals where it's a pay what you can model. <clears throat> um, what's already happened, so we've been working a lot with state senators and representatives. Uh, state Senator Whitcoast is uh, kind of our primary cheerleader. Yeah, primary <laughs> cheerleader. Um, we're working with the DECD. Once the like collective bond bill passes, we have an appointment to sit with the DECD, which is right now scheduled for the 20-something of October, to say which pools of money could we get grant funding out of, because it's a total of a $2.75 million project from where it is now to opening with a financial cushion, with contingency money, with prevailing wage and asbestos abatement and a clerk of the works. like. It's a big sum of money to take what is a nice school building, but put in a commercial kitchen, upgrade the things that need to be upgrading, redo the parking lot, et cetera. Um, so we're meeting with DECD to talk about that. Um, we're working closely with the Hartford Foundation, um, and we are expecting the IRS says we'll get our 501c3 back by the 4th of October. They say everything looks good. Um, so that's where we are with, that's a quick summary of this past year and a half. It's on a slide, really nice and convenient. Um, there's staffing. There's a full staffing breakdown online that I won't go into a lot here because I know we're running short on time. Uh, our annual operating cost is about a million dollars. And so we've crafted the budget for the past, well, year and a half. We just had it done in June that we got it audited by TBA Consulting, which is a nonprofit consulting firm in Hartford, to say, do our construction numbers look like realistic? And does our budget look possible? And it came back actually stronger than we had expected expected it was. So that has us with um, like $20,000 the first year to reinvest into the center. And by the third year, $180,000 of what we bring in to reinvest into the center, which allows us, you know, our plan is to ask for a, a lease from the town of Granby for a dollar a year. And then at five or 10 years, enter into the conversation about buying the building, which at that point, we should be financially stable enough to like, have a serious conversation about. And in 10 or 15 years, the roof will need to be redone as well. So leasing it for a dollar a year allows us to get off the ground solidly enough that we can then do right by the building and the town of Granby <laughs> and then take it over long term. Um, most of our income comes from, actually half of our income comes from the adult daycare program, which is also half of our expenses. We're working with the Alzheimer's Association who have said, yes, there's a, there's a huge need for like memory care, adult daycare in this region. Like the, nearest one that's at least the Alzheimer's Association has in their list is Litchfield. Um, if the adult daycare program doesn't work, if it isn't the need that we think it is, that space gets rented out to other nonprofits. Our budget drops considerably and we bring in actually extra money to reinvest. So the adult daycare is not the like financially strongest thing we could do with that space, but we think it is meeting a need that's not met. And because of the initial leasing of the building for a dollar a year, the sharing of costs, we think we can get it up and running. And that's a really hard thing to do. There's a reason that a lot of them are closing. And us sharing the costs with so many other spaces makes that possible. Our fundraising budget includes a $300,000 cushion so that we open the doors with the ability of actually paying staff. Um, and fundraising potential is really strong. We've built out a budget that relies on uh, some cafe income, some space rental income, um, that's it. Most of it's workshops. cafe and space, like some workshop fees, uh, budgeting roughly $5 per person per workshop goes to keeping the lights on and the building staffed. Um, because we work with seniors and Alzheimer's Association and food share and food security and youth and veterans, the ability for us to apply for programming grants and get them is really strong, but we've built out a budget that does not rely on that because it can't. We know that for it to be successful, 
we do have to be able to keep this going ourselves. That said, there is a, a lot of grant opportunity we haven't tapped into that we know is there. And so one of the budget line items is for a development director um, to work like 20 hours a week and help us with some of that stuff. Uh, budgets online, all the links on our website, kernscommunitycenter.org, bring you to the living documents. So whether that's the like 30 page proposal, that's like, here's how everything will work and how we'll structure staff um, or the budget, which is maybe another 30 pages of here's the income and expenses for every one of the spaces. Uh, all that's available. Feel free to take a look, send us <coughs> emails. Uh, and our next steps. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so um, Granby Board of Selectmen put together an advisory committee and they met and already gave their final um, results. And they, um, they had some contingencies with the approval. You know, they want us to have money in hand before we open up and start construction, obviously. Um, and also they had some minor things like, um, you know, making sure that we meet the neighbor's needs in terms of noise and very basic things that we would expect to be doing anyway. Um, we're, we've also been having these conversations with surrounding towns to get support and, um, and also hear town's concerns so that we can factor that in when we're, you know, still in the planning stages. And then of course our fundraising, that's the big, right, $2.7 million. Um, that's our big hurdle. Yeah. And we're working with about 10 towns that um, we, we expect the indoor park gets uh, people from 10 towns and that the park in East Hampton gets people from East Granby. Hmm. Um, so the indoor park, the fact that the space will be intentionally built with special needs and families of special needs children in mind, um, it, the whole place being physically accessible, the teen center, the community wood shop, the veteran space that's separate and also integrated, um, we expect those draw a lot from uh, the 10 towns that we're working with. And so in these conversations, we've had the same, what are you afraid of us doing? Where, you know, initially I was like, we should put in a board game room, that would be amazing. But Storyteller's Cottage does a really good job of that and we don't wanna, we don't need to do that, right? What we get to do is uplift for everyone around, you know, which town do you live in? Here's the board of what's happening in your community. Because what's sometimes hard is moving to a space and not knowing that all of these resources already exist and this community center only succeeds if it's like with everything else that's already happening. If it comes at the expense of it, it something else it fails. And we've known that from the start. That's it. All right, well, thank you. Uh, what questions do folks have? Uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> um, a couple of quick, uh, hi, I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> um, so can I go back to, um, talk about the adult daycare um, and services and the revenue coming from that those services so I'm confused a little bit as to which uh, offerings its facility would be for pay which ones would not be for pay gotcha um, so the adult daycare as a service is for pay and that's private pay until maybe one day if we have enough of a pool we can wait for insurance reimbursement we expect it's private pay for the first while that we budget mm -hmm. it out um, rates for that are $45 for a half day or $75 for a whole day in the region. And we're working with the Connecticut Association of Adult Daycare Programs to make sure that we're fully certified. So there's two models in Connecticut. There's a social model and a medical model. The social model is for people who don't need like locks on the doors or are not harm risks to themselves and others. And we'll be the social model. That's, I need to go to work for nine hours, but I'm worried if I leave my mom in her house, she'll forget that the stove is on. It's that level of you need community, you need engagement, you need socialization to like slow the disease progression. Um, you don't need extensive medical care. We mm -hmm. will have a nurse on staff to help with certain medical like medicine administration, mm -hmm. but it's a really like low key space. That's for pay because it's a active, like active staff are paying attention to your needs. Mm -hmm. The indoor park is a free space. That's come and use it and we, you know, we expect that people will go to the cafe, which is next door to the indoor park, and get some stuff to eat or drink, but the park is free to use. Um, workshops are, will depend on how the person who's running it is charging. Are you just running a workshop for your business that's free? Then you, as the business owner, will pay us to use the space, somewhere between $25 and $50 an hour, depending on how big your business is. Um, are you 
running a yoga class with your existing yoga studio, but moving into another space to attract more people and you're charging each person individually, then we'll ask that $5 per person goes to the center. Yeah, I was gonna, so if, just, if you'd just bear with me, I've just got some random yes. thoughts. Yes, um, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I, I'm sure that those uh, those thousands of meetings you've already been through those that, those are enough of a root canal. So I apologize. One more root canal. Uh, the um, that, that's I was thinking to myself the cautionary tale of uh, overuse by outside organizations or such or you so who are using your, your goodwill and your space to do the pro promote their own. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, it's good that you're th thinking about controls around that yeah. and the controls around overuse or just. Um, just such popularity of certain services that you can't deliver to everybody who wants to come that day and participate. And managing right. that message is going to be very difficult, I can imagine. Yep. I'm sure you're thinking all about that. There, there's really helpful, um, like these mixed space community centers, there's really helpful suites of software that help with, is this something that needs registration? Here's, here's how to do that. Here's mm -hmm. how it links to your central account. Here's how you can oversee it. Here's how, if you need to, you can email everyone who went to or is planning on coming to this thing. So there too, we don't have to invent things from scratch. We get to learn from everyone else's learning things the hard way. Mm -hmm. We will still learn things the hard way, but it gets to be a little bit further on down the road. It's, uh, thank you. It's two more. Uh, um, so I imagine you're here because mm -hmm. you want our buy-in to a certain extent, or you're here you're here to inform us of the great stuff that's going on mm -hmm. up the road potentially, and for us to hopefully uh, look on it favorably and participate in some way. So that's the ask. So is there going to be from your is will you be directly asking the whichever of the 10 towns that you've targeted that you directly ask for a contribution from the towns or you could be purely fundraising privately right we've been really well we're asking the state for money um but we have been explicit from the start that we're not asking the towns for money um in that assuming much like the town of granby or the town of east granby the budgets are pretty slim if you know granby closed the school three years ago and ran a committee to say what should we do with the center and one of the like top options was do a community center, but they didn't have the staff or resources to do it, which is what why it's open. Um, if the money existed in towns to do this programming, we think it would be already done. Sure. We just don't think it's okay. there. Thank you. That wasn't saying that that you shouldn't do. It, mm -hmm. uh, and the last thing is uh, just to help me understand: absent fundraising and absent some um, environmental unseen environmental uh, issue that you have at the building what are your three biggest barriers do you feel for success we thought about it absent fundraising absent fundraising in that building is you know uh, pandora's box what is what what have you thought about well if it's not fundraising and it's not mysterious environmental thing we didn't see coming it's not a test. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can fold your cards and Those say this is nothing things, at all. Right? Let's go with, let's go with what you, you highlighted, that it would be too you. popular. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that, was a, that was a cop out. Good job. Good job. That's good. All right. I okay. remember that when my, on my own meeting tomorrow. My staff. <laughs> you Sean, just you say you're not going to be asked to be on the executive board. Um, I do. I've got conflicts at night. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Thank you. This is outstanding. As, as you just articulated, I, it sounds like Granby, and we've honestly struggled with a lot of these issues. We've, mm -hmm. we've got a robust senior center offering, but as you look back at our minutes and multiple boards of selectmen, we've been struggling for 10 years to address the senior community center issue with staring down a five, 10, whatever million dollar price tag for a new building or a build out or otherwise. Right. So this is outstanding that, that you folks are capitalizing on this opportunity. I, I, I would, um, I'm not writing the check tonight, but I, I would push uh, harder to make sure that you're, you're finding a way to keep track of communities that are participating from yes. a resident standpoint. I think where Chris is going, yeah. because um, you know, you're going to do for 2.7 what we haven't been able to do for 5 or 10 million, and again, in the foreseeable future is going to be particularly challenging. Um, so, and this certainly sounds like it's going to benefit, again, Simsbury, Granby, Canton, East Granby, Avon, lots of different places. And to me, the definition of regionalism, you know, it's a it's a buzzword down at the Capitol and folks just throw that regionalism term and they don't realize how much stuff like this and other shared services go on. So, again, I commend you folks for this. So I, I let's keep the conversation going very much on, on how we can help support you on the fundraising side, whether it is, can, you know, on the, you know, uh, submitting a letter of support for grants or talking to that pesky, or pesky senator at or or... Uh, <laughs> or other folks, or eventually, you know, do we get to a, a point where there's so much usage, or there's um, there there is a need where the towns 
that residents are con you know are utilizing the facility should be contributing in in some way, whether it be services or or some sort of uh, some sort of contribution. So, I'd like to keep our minds open to mm -hmm. that. It's a great example potentially of how much better the private sector can do than government. Yes, that's true. Um, just no one question. quick yeah. detail question: are, are you anticipating seven days a week open or? Yeah, yep. um, not sure on hours yet. Um, Mm -hmm. Not the adult like, daycare. Right, adult daycare, not seven days a week. Right. Um, especially because turnover in the adult daycare industry is really high. We're being really intentional that um, we're paying people sustainably. It's a healthy work environment that we're bringing on people who are really like mission driven mm -hmm. and then they can stay there long term. Mm -hmm. um, so that's five days a week because that consistency is important for mm -hmm. the participants as well. The rest of the building, yes, seven days a week. I know one of the challenges local organizations have found with running programs for kids um, is that uh, parents tend to leave their kids and go to stop and shop and then come back. Are, are you going to be uh, handling that or are you going to be? Yeah, yeah. It's part, of, part of our plan for why we think this is so successful is it's right across from Stop and Shop and right. TJ Maxx. <laughs> so we're kind of counting on yep. drop your kids off, do this other thing, or drop your kids off in the teen center and then you go do this other thing or you just sit quietly or, or whatnot. So we are right. building that in and we're working with uh, like the six or seven colleges around here to say what type of internship programs do you have and how does that align with all the different offerings? Because whether you want to go into like rehabilitation, education, or youth work, or mm -hmm. whatnot. We'll have internship opportunities available. That's great. Right. Sounds like you have a good plan. Folks, I really thought this through. It's impressive. Uh, Mike? Um, I, I will admit I was a little skeptical when I saw this on our agenda, and then I read through your proposal, and I was really impressed. I think you guys um, are not fish oil sales people, <laughs> um, and, and I think you've really uh, – dotted a lot of the I's and crossed the T's and I, I commend you for it and uh, as you've heard uh, from everybody there's there's some serious interest here and I would love to see more of it. Thank right. you and thank you for reading the whole proposal. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough on this little screen but you know I got big thick glasses at home. I'll so. admit I skipped to the budget but yeah <laughs> I went to your million dollar operating budget. I was like, are there other thank questions? Well done. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I was going to recommend as next steps that once the Granby uh, Select Board officially gives their sign off, that our board could talk about um, you know what it could look like, what we could do, whether it's a letter of support or some other way of showing our uh, support to help you get funding uh, from the various folks you're going to be reaching out to. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I would agree. And because it's not our select board, I would ask them for that 50000 in savings that they're going to see <laughs> as, a, as a contribution. <laughs> but. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank guys. You. All right, we'll move on to my first selectman's report. Uh, we've got a, um, a grand opening that we celebrated uh, yesterday. Uh, construction uh, finished and Simsbury Public Library's newest program room is now open. The Terrafill room is a beautiful space located on the lower level of the library and will be able to seat up to 80 people. This renovation was made possible thanks to the hard work of a lot of people, including um, the Board of Selectmen, uh, the previous Board of Selectmen, uh, former First Selectwoman Lisa Hevner, the Board of Finance, the Library Board of Trustees, the Library Building Committee, and the Friends of the Library. Also, significant funding for this project was provided for by the state, so we thank Representative Hampton and Senator Whitkos for their support. The public is invited to attend a ribbon cutting at Fitzgerald Foods to celebrate their new facade and other updates. That's scheduled for October 3rd at 5 p.m. On October 11th from 1 to 3 p.m., the town will be hosting a community event for the painting of a permanent rainbow walkway on the Greenway near the Performing Arts Center. In celebration of Simsbury's LGBTQ plus community, the Rainbow Walkway will replace the nearby crosswalk that was recently converted black to white, back to white stripes. On August 12th, the Board of Selectmen unanimously endorsed the concept of a permanent walkway. Earlier this summer, the town asked residents to submit ideas for a permanent design, and we're currently seeking feedback from the LGBTQ plus community via social media. Then on October 11th, National Coming Out Day, the community is invited to join us near the Performing Arts Center to help paint the permanent design. In recent years, there have been growing encounters between our residents and wildlife. This is not just apparent anecdotally, but it's reflected in the calls for service data provided by our police department. 
This is particularly a challenging issue at the local level because wildlife policy is managed by the state. I believe we also need to look at all of our options locally so that we're remaining proactive. At our last meeting on September 9th, the Board of Selectmen requested that the Public Safety Subcommittee begin work on a draft wildlife feeding ordinance. The drafting of an ordinance is a public process and we'll be seeking input from the community in the months ahead. How the ordinance is structured and what exactly is prohibited is still very much open to conversation. Uh, and now Maria, Maria for the Town Manager's Report. Great, thank you. I think we're sharing the mic. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. Uh, good evening. For departmental news and notes, we have a couple of updates from engineering. Um, as you'll recall, uh, during the summer, our grant application to CROG for the $1.58 million in federal funding uh, for the Transportation Alternatives uh, Set-Aside Grant um, was endorsed by CROG. That has continued to progress through the process, and CROG did forward that to the Department of Transportation, which it's currently under review. Um, as you'll recall, the, uh, the federal government, uh, this particular round of funding would be for fiscal years 2021 through 2025. Um, that funding has not yet officially been authorized by the federal government, but we do remain optimistic that it will become available. Um, and what we do have, we're very fortunate, we do have um, some uh, local funding uh, that has been uh, in the capital budget over a number of years for this particular project. So we um, are working on uh, permits, plans, et cetera. Um, so that sort of very important design and planning work is underway in the event uh, that the federal government does authorize this grant funding. Um, so again, good news, it continues to move through all the steps and processes that it needs to. The uh, new park, uh, Hotbrook Landing at the Flower Bridge, we do have an update. Um, as you know, uh, the abatement and demolition activities occurred and the house is officially down. Um, the project uh, continues to move forward and uh, this week we were removing the wood retaining wall and completing some rough grading of the site. Uh, the pavilion and storage shed construction is underway, and we are working on planning the vegetative buffer um, along Drake Hill Road this week. Um, we are moving along, and do you expect to be substantially complete by the end of the construction season in November? A few updates from police. Um, some of you were able to join us for the uh, swearing-in ceremony for J.P. Lassard, who was recently promoted from patrol officer first class to sergeant on August 19th. Uh, he participated in a competitive process and was selected to fill a first-line supervisor vacancy. Uh, his promotion was approved by the police commission on August 12th, and he has been assigned to the patrol division. So congratulations to, to now Sergeant Lassard. And on August 29th, Patrol Officer First Class Jamison Ball uh, was assigned to replace uh, Sergeant Lassard as the Community Services Officer. Um, so this is the individual that engages in a number of our community events, um, coordinating our police-based uh, community and safety programs. Um, and so again, we encourage folks to reach out to him uh, if they uh, need his services. A note from uh, the police uh, and town manager's office. Uh, we have been receiving today feedback from a number of attendees uh, from the Simsbury fly-in regarding difficulties with traffic and parking. Um, so the police department will be conducting an after action review of this event. Um, we're hoping that this will help to identify improvements in regards to traffic and parking management for next year's event. We've really seen this event just continue to grow and grow and grow over years, over the years. And again, traffic and parking was most definitely an issue this year. So we will be reviewing that again um, working with other uh, local police agencies as well as the event organizers to try and identify ways that we can improve again parking and traffic for next year. Uh, from Public Works, this is a really neat student project. Um, we have a group of senior civil engineering students from UConn um, who are going to be working with an experienced engineer um, to investigate long-term options for the realignment of Notch and Dry Bridge Roads in Simsbury. Um, this is a very busy roadway in town. Uh, it's narrow, um, it's curvy and hilly, um, and the road does present many, uh, many issues related to safety. Um, so they are going to be working on developing some concept conceptual plans as well as possible cost estimates estimates to better realign that particular roadway area. So we're really grateful to the students for the work that they'll be doing for us. A reminder that the Culture, Parks, and Recreation uh, Department is working on the Parks and Open Space Master Plan. Again, we're encouraging our residents and our stakeholders to participate in the online survey, and we have links to the survey um, on the manager's report. And lastly, for special events, uh, the movie in the park, which was previously scheduled for a couple of weekends ago, unfortunately was postponed due to rain. Um, we will be hosting that event on Saturday, September 28th. It's still at the Simsbury Meadows. Um, the gates are going to open a little earlier just because it is starting to get dark a little sooner now. So gates will open at five and I believe the movie will start estimated around seven, 
seven, seven, about seven. 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 Yes, exactly, exactly. Thank you. Um, and again, that, that is a free event, um, and we really hope that folks can come and join us for that. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, moving on to selectman action. Uh, item A is tax refund requests. Is there a motion effective September 23rd, 2019 to approve the presented tax refunds in the amount of $6,108.45 and to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the tax refunds? So moved. Second. Any conversation? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any <clears throat> opposed? That motion carries. Um, item B, uh, the Simsbury Main Street Partnership is providing a, a generous donation uh, to support Simsbury Celebrates, which is a great event that brings uh, thousands of people to the uh, center of Simsbury the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Uh, is there a motion effective September 23rd, 2019 to accept a donation in the amount of $5,000 from the Simsbury Main Street Partnership, Inc. for the purpose of supporting the annual Simsbury Celebrates event? So moved. Second. Any further conversation? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that motion carries. Uh, item C is uh, the proposed fiscal year uh, 1920 emergency management performance grant. So this is a, um, a grant that is applied for each year. Um, the fire district applies, but the town is a pass-through. So uh, Maria, the municipal CEO, needs to sign off on the grant application. Um, other, before we uh, put the motion out there, are there any questions on this item? Okay. Is there a motion effective September 23rd, 2019 to apply for the 2019-2020 Emergency Management Performance Grant as presented and authorize Maria Capriola, Town Manager, to execute all documents related to the grant should it be awarded? So moved. Second. <clears throat> any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Uh, item D, uh, the Public Gathering uh, Committee has uh, approved the Simsbury Performing Arts Center uh, Raise a Paw event. It's scheduled for October 6th at the Performing Arts Center from 10 to 2. Uh, is there a motion effective uh, September 23rd, 2019 to approve the public gathering application for the Simsbury Performing Arts Center Raise a Paw event as presented and authorize the issuance of the public gathering permit? So move. Second. Is there any conversation? Um, could we just have Missy give us a quick... Uh Summary of what it is. Yes, absolutely. Please. Sure. Yes. Yes. Please step Thank up. you. <laughs> I love this opportunity. Just so everybody here. Assuming it involves dogs. <laughs> it does involve dogs. Right, we love this. So we actually had this event last year, um, and they expect anywhere between 200 and 500 people. We had about 200 people last year because there was a little weather issue, but this year hopefully not. People are welcome to come with their dogs. There are dog vendors. There are food vendors, and. It's free and open to the public, but if you want to participate in their dog challenge course, you would pay into that. Um, and they have raised money through sponsorships, and they have media partnerships, and all of the money goes back to the Rob Branham Foundation for leukemia. That's terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions on this? Okay, so the motion has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you, Missy. Um, item E is um, revisions to the golf course T sign advertising policy. Uh, so a little bit of context here. The town has an agreement with the Simsbury Farms Men's Club to allow the club to sell T signs at the golf course. And then that money is used to fund projects on the golf course. Over the years, T signs have raised more than $50,000 uh, for projects, including green, greens renovations and other things. Uh, the Men's Club has requested revisions to the existing policy. And we have with us uh, Dave Bush from the Culture Parks and Rec Commission. And I just wanted to see if you wouldn't mind coming up to the podium and just giving just a little summary on what those changes are. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. The main change is the men's club have acted as the primary collector and advertiser of, of getting advertising sponsors. And a little issue came up a, a while back that they didn't have final control over how the money is spent. Uh, and so this is really born out of a new set of directors on the Simsbury Farms Men's Club. It's an appropriate request though. They have done such great work. It's the only reason the program exists. It's a win-win for the town because we know budgets can be challenging as it relates to spending on the golf course. So we, are the, we were unanimous at Park and Rec in voting in support of this proposed change. And really the only change the Men's Club requested was that they had the final ability to say how the money was actually spent, consistent though with any town policy, rules, and regulations. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Um, 
Is there a motion effective September uh, 23rd, 2019 to approve the proposed revisions to the Simsbury Farms Golf Course T sign advertising policy? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. And item F is uh, we've re received a request to waive the greens fees for the Connecticut State Golf Association's Public Links Golf Championship, which will be taking place in early August of uh, next year at Simsbury Farms. Uh, the golf course would be closed to the, the public for two consecutive uh, weekdays. The fee waiver request is just for the greens fees. It would not be uh, include the cart rentals, which would continue to be uh, paid in full. Are there any... Um, any questions anyone had about this request? Uh, Chris. Can Dave answer the questions? Yeah. yeah. I, I, Thank I, you, Dave. Oh. The, uh, so what's <laughs> it, Dave, just explain to us the, the precedent around the, the waiver. So we have, on many occasions in the past, had various state-run tournaments at Simsbury Farms. The whole idea here is, this is marketing 101, is let's get our course exposed to some of the most active golfers in the state of Connecticut. Uh, it is advertised throughout the Connecticut Golf Association journals as to this is where the event's being played. It results in very competitive golfers all wanting to have a practice round or two. So we're going to gather that revenue. We recently confirmed with Wintonberry, who did it this year, they actually earned a profit from the amount of play they got associated with the practice rounds and the cart rentals and there's also a food surcharge that is sponsored by the Connecticut Golf Association so again we are fully in support of this I realize we never really want to close our course for a couple of days but it's weekdays it's August this is a win-win again mm -hmm. any questions just a quick question are the fees that we split with the pro still gonna get split or do we get the golf cart fees for this I, we have not addressed that directly. I would actually anticipate that it would probably be treated like any other golf cart uh, rental. Um, we can certainly address that, though, with John, if that's a concern of the, of the Board of Selectmen. I'm just thinking with all that play and everything else, if there's – if the town's not the beneficiary of the revenues, it's just – Well, I think the town thing. would be the beneficiary of the revenues associated with the practice rounds. Because they'll, they'll, you know, they'll pay full bore for any practice rounds they want to do. Okay. All right. Uh, to – on the – um, topic of revenue uh, for the folks who haven't read the submission. Uh, projected revenue loss, or the waiver totals. So uh, they I were could looking, do the math in the participants, but I don't know what it is. Right. So we're talking nominal dollars, literally a couple grand loss. And Wittenberry reported about a thousand dollar gain from having hosted the event this year. Okay. And uh, will we would we be required to? For those residents or players who aren't aware of it and walk up, are we going to be required to give them any sort of a rain date check for future? I prefer not to have to offset, doubly offset a loss if we. Season pass what I would anticipate would be we would get in front of this as far as the website and the marketing materials to make it very well known that not only is the course not going to be open, but the website will be set up so it won't even accept the tee time on that day. I realize, like you're thinking, some people do just walk up on their own. And, you know, the idea of a rain check. You know, it's simply going to be a matter of we, we close the course for private tournaments. Yeah. I just uh, prefer we, yeah, we, it's, let's, let's not double hit our, so I'm no. the advocate of not doing. Right. I think the key to that is simply getting the word out. Good. Thank you. And again, it's, it's two weekdays, which uh, play it during August during the week is pretty light. So people who have already bought their season passes already know that this is going to happen? No, because you guys haven't approved it yet. <laughs> it's coming up next meeting, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, and this isn't until next year. So, so – so this is 2020. This is. Right. Yeah. We'll have plenty of time. And again, season pass holders, part of their buying it is when we have private events that, that say it's mm -hmm. taking up the entire course, it's a day they don't play. And we really have not had an issue with them. They understand we have to do what we need to do to you know, meet the bottom line. I think we also should take in consideration this is not a, a, a reoccurring event mm -hmm. at Simsbury Farms. It may come back on the tour or some year, mm -hmm. but... So we're looking at this as a one time, and I do support the concept of it being a promotional, um, you know, sort of puts a lens on a fantastic facility for people around the state. So mm -hmm. I support that. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion effective September 23rd, 2019, to approve the requested waiver of Greens fees for the Connecticut State Golf Association's 2020 Public Links Golf Championship? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes. 
Um, finally, item G, um, we'll be joined by uh, Amy Merriweather, our town's finance director, for an end of year review and to discuss uh, year end transfer requests. Just for last. Absolutely. <laughs> Excited to get Most to do this again. Too. <laughs> All right, so I'll try not to bore you with the stuff that we went over at the budget status report, so I'll try to give you the highlights since then. So the town closed the year with revenues in excess of expenditures of about $2.2 million. Um, the majority of this was related to the revenues that were over budget by about $2 million. So the major reason for this is that we had an unbudgeted bond premium. We went out to bond in the spring that we received a premium of like $1.2 million. And then we also had um, some designated fund balance of $2 million. There was a $1 million that was going to go to the health insurance fund, and then there was a $1 million that was to offset some um, mill rate relief. And none of that money was used from fund balance because we had so much excess revenue. Um, on the expenditure side, we had savings of about 140000 so minimal savings there, but helped. On the Simsbury Farm side, we had a $495,000 deficit. However, 267,000 of this was due to an accounting change during the year. Um, so what we found was that revenue wasn't being deferred in the appropriate period. So what's supposed to happen is when you have your program, the year of the program is supposed to be the year of the revenues and the expenditures. So programs were happening in July and August, but fees for those programs were being collected anywhere from January, February, March. So those revenues really need to be taken out of fiscal year 19 and put into fiscal year 20. Had this been done from the start, we wouldn't have this loss. But since it wasn't done from the start, we're correcting, and so now the fund has to take a one-time hit. I did talk to the auditors about this, considering it would be such a significant hit to the fund. And since it, wasn't, um, it didn't come up as part of discussion in any of the previous audits, um, so because this isn't a major fund, they look at the revenues year over year, and if they're pretty consistent, they won't question it. However, if they do um, question it in a year that we didn't record it, not only is it a management comment to us, but due to the dollar value, it could be a deficiency. So they advised us to record it. Can we just stop for a second on that? So sure. they never bothered to look at it, but they would have written us up for it? Well, they never bothered to look at it because it was consistent. It sounded right. like it was so never a real big year problem. over year. It didn't show yeah. up. So yeah. if there was ever a year where it wasn't consistent and they started, so this is the year. It? It's going to be mm -hmm. the anomaly. They no, I understand that. My, my point is, is that they can audit and they can dive deep on whatever they want. And in considering we've had the same auditor for 20 years, I'm surprised that they never dove deep on this. It was never a major fund. No. Yeah, that's it's disappointing because that's what we pay the auditors for. Mm -hmm. Um, the remaining loss of 228000 is the actual deficit of the fund, and that's comparable to the prior year loss of $229,000. Um, in your packet, I gave you a breakdown of each of the programs, the rec, the complex, the golf, and the loss without the deferred revenue, so you could compare it to last year. And then I just wanted to note on the Simsbury Farms Administration, this had a deficit of $217,000. Um, $100,000 of this is offset by the general fund transfer into the fund. So your actual deficit is only $117,000. But I just wanted to point out here, it's not a true deficit. These are all your indirect costs of the program. Um, the offset of, say, golf, for example, is your true revenue, your true expenditures of all the direct costs. These are all your indirect costs, and, um, such as the electricity, um, utilities, things of that nature that aren't directly related to that program, they should be allocated amongst all the programs. The reason that we don't allocate it amongst all the programs is because that would be a bookkeeping nightmare. <laughs> so we just have it sitting out. Um, the health insurance fund had revenues exceeding expenditures of about $13,000. And I just wanted to point out that this is mainly due to the million dollar transfer into the health insurance fund that was made during the year. Um, if that transfer had not been made, the fund would have had suffered a deficit of $986,000. And then finally, the sewer fund, the last major fund, we had a Dorset Crossing payment of an FCC charge of $521,000 um, and a remaining surplus of $264,000. The $264,000 is in line with budgetary estimates, so that $500, um, $500 FCC fee is what gave us that great um, revenue exceeding expenditures to get to the seven hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars surplus. That's a question on that. Why are they building two sixty-five and fund surplus every year? 
Um, I talked to Tony. They are actually trying to get their fund balance up around six million dollars so that when the state makes it so that they have to, I guess there's like a major conversion or something that we took out that clean water loan for. Yeah. So that when we are up for um, another conversion, we don't have to go out and get a loan for it. But the, the money's, isn't the clean water fund free? It's two percent. I thought it was either, it's, it's two percent. Okay. So mm -hmm. with inflation, it's practically free. Yeah. Okay. But that's the rationale behind what they're doing. Let's just remember that when somebody tries to go. Noted. Or another 20 million. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was it for the major items. Does anybody have any questions on that before I move on to the transfers or any of the schedules that are in there? Thank you for the presentation. This way it makes it really easy to. Yeah, much easier to save. Sure. I, have a, I have a question on the um, documentation for the capital reserve fund. I don't know if you want to dis dis discuss that now or later. Um, Why do it after capital transfers? Sure. Do yeah. I have everything out there? Yeah. Okay. So for general fund transfers, you'll see that there's a, um, a schedule in your packet that has a summary of everything. So just to go down the list, there's three special revenue funds that I'm proposing we close out. These are special revenue funds that date anywhere back from fiscal year 12 to fiscal year 14 that are carrying deficit balances in the funds. The first one is the Hazard Mitigation Fund. This was a grant fund where it looks like the grants were overspent. It's only about $2,000, so there's nothing major there. And um, that one does date back to 2012. There's a POCD grant fund. This one has is showing a deficit of $13,000. Um, there was a module that was purchased for about $25,000 and then grant funds received of $12,000. I'm not sure if the town was supposed to match that grant um, for the other $13,000 or if where the grant money was received and posted to the wrong fund. It's not really clear and it dates back to 2012, so we don't have any clear documentation on it. Um, and then the last one is for the Hartford Charette Project. There was a budget of $175. $175,000 to conduct a land use study on the Hartford property. There was a donation of $145,000 that went into this fund, and then the town was supposed to fund the additional $30,000, and that transfer never went in. So that fund is showing in a deficit as well. The health insurance fund, we're requesting an additional $400,000 to go into this fund. So as you'll recall, during the budget season, this fund was insolvent. We made the fund solvent. The Board of Finance contributed an extra $850,000 into this fund to get us to about 19, 18, 19% of expected claims. The industry standard is 20 to 25%. So we're requesting an additional $400,000 and that'll get us to about 22% of um, expected claims and within the industry standards. The Simsbury Farms Fund, we're requesting um, $516,000 to go into that fund and offset the loss that I already talked about. And then the Capital Reserve, we're requesting a million dollars to go into that fund. So the rationale behind the Capital Reserve um, proposal was that when we were doing um, budget work during the budgeting season, the Board of Finance was comfortable with the fund balance and the general fund being around 15%. So at the end of the current fiscal year, I have a chart in here, the general fund fund balance would be around 18%. So after all of the transfers for the health insurance fund, closing out the special revenue funds and a deficit, this still left us substantial savings where we're still high above that 15% number. Um, so one of the things that our fiduciary advisors um, like to see is a capital reserve, mill rate stabilization fund, something outside of the general fund. Um, so therefore, we're proposing that we put this into a capital reserve fund so that we can reduce our bonding in future years. So that's where that came from. And then um, some expenditures that staff is requesting. Um, the $18,000 request for economic development marketing materials. This was denied in the fiscal year 20 budget season due to budgetary constraints. And then staff is also looking for some funds for professional de development um, for members of the leadership team. And the total of the EDC and the professional development is 28500 And just to be clear, we're not giving EDC $18,000 to go create marketing material. This is a refresh of the current marketing materials that we have, right? Because otherwise it would be a whole like of a lot more money. Yes, as That's presented during the budget. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on the general fund transfers before I move on to capital? No? Okay. So for the capital transfers, we had various sewer fund projects that were closed out, totaling $691,000.
All of these projects were funded via the sewer use fund, so to close them out, we're simply recommending that the money go back into the sewer use fund. There were several projects totaling $215,000 that were funded via bond proceeds that are being closed out. And in discussion with our bond council, they recommend that um, we reduce our future borrowing and all of these proceeds be put into our next borrowing. Our next borrowing is going to be for the Henry James renovation. So we're looking to transfer that money into the Henry James project to reduce our borrowing um, associated with the, um, I believe, $18 million we're borrowing for that project. And then lastly, there's some um, projects that are being closed out that were funded via general fund funds. And those were just recommending they go back into the general fund. And then there was three capital reserve um, capital projects that were went slightly over budget and we're proposing to clean those up and just use capital capital reserve funds um, to offset those and then there was one additional request for some fencing at the band shell that was supposed to be done during um, fiscal year 21 it was part of the fiscal year 21 capital plan um, but due to um, complaints related to the fencing which Maria can speak to more than I can um, they're requesting to move up that project and complete the fencing now for $100,000. That's all I got. Amy, on the, uh, back to the capital reserve fund, to you, two questions. What led to the recommendation of a million dollars? What were the, kind of the parameters behind that versus? Keeping that general fund around 15%. Um, percent. It was actually 15% percent plus a little bit more for our pension. So we recently found out um, that our accrued liability for our pension is going to go up because the mortality rates for governmental employees, governmental employees are living longer. So in talking to our actuaries, that's going to increase our accrued liability for our pension plans about 5% for the general government and 5% for BOE. So taking that three to $600,000 into account, I pretty much just backed into all the other transfers that we're requesting and try to get that number around 15% to keep the general fund fund balance at 15% and then requested the extra million. So, so that's an answer of, you know, trying to trying to stay with the 15% mm -hmm. as much as possible into the capital reserve, as opposed to are there other things we looked at in terms of what the appropriate level of capital reserve should be? I mean, it's a fair amount of money that ends up not being utilized for other purposes. That's that's kind of why I'm exploring that. So whether it should be put into other projects now? Well, why why a million versus five hundred thousand seven hundred and fifty? I under, understand that that's what's available to put into it. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm also looking at is what what do we need from an accounting point of view to appropriately have that reserve fund doing what we want it to do, and is it the same number or is it more? And and so we're putting a yeah. the answer is it should be two million, but we only have a million, right. so we're put so that's the answer. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is the short answer. Um, it's Maria can talk more to the study. So we're putting in a million now, but there are actually ongoing town studies around our infrastructure and facility needs where those are going to be ongoing costs. And I believe was it was at 2.8 million or something like that where we should be. Yeah, where you can speak to the sure, staff about sure, it. Sure, right. So this capital reserve issue goes back to a lot of what we spoke about during budget season and that uh, we have about a six to seven year period that if we keep our debt service and cash for capital at 7% of budget, the 7% is completely consumed by debt service of past projects. And so we have a capacity issue for some of those um, you know, capital needs that are baseline needs that we would typically want to be paying for in cash, um, whether it's you know a $50,000 you know, playground improvement or um, paving and paying for paving in cash, paving that's maintenance, not major reconstruction. So again, if we are able to build up the capital reserve, um, that provides us with some cash to pay for a lot of the smaller projects that should not be bonded for. So we, again, have that ability to pay for some of those projects in cash. Another possibility to help with the debt service um, issue, um, again, with that 7% being fully consumed by debt service, is the capital reserve could also be used to offset some of those debt service uh, payments or some of the debt service increase. Um, so we can use that to apply to future debt service payments. So uh, building up that capital reserve will really um, help us with that, uh, essentially the cash for capital capacity that we're going to have with already being at that, that 7%. Yep. Yeah, I'm totally comfortable with what we're trying to totally support it. And part of what I like about this uh, re report is there's a number of things that we've wanted to do for a period of time that we can kind of restore to sanity. So this is more just due diligence that in actuality, it's a fairly significant change of like how we do things. 
Um, so I, I just want to make make sure you know we're being really thoughtful about it. So you've answered the first question. Is in reality it should be about 2.5 to 2.8. Mm -hmm. This is what you know we're able to put in. So it's a good start. Right. Um, my second question is: Did you get signals from the board of finance in support of this, either you know explicitly or through conversation? What was their guidance? So they were supportive of the million dollar transfer into the capital reserve fund. Um, the capital projects that were funded via general fund proceeds, um, I think it was about two or $300,000 that are, we're requesting going to the general fund. They actually wanted it. I actually recommended we put it into the capital reserve to continue to build that up. And they were adamantly against it. Um, they didn't provide any reason. I'm not sure why they just voted on it. And so Oh, my, yes, they're yeah. for it, and yes, they're against yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Just, I'll remind everybody: this is the issue that we debated with the Board of Finance several yeah. months ago. Mm -hmm. I debated with them because this is their capital reserve fund that they set up yeah. at everyone's request, and then they didn't want to fund it during the budget process because they couldn't remember what it was. But <laughs> now they they gave us the million dollars for it. But then, as Amy said, they turned around and didn't want the additional three hundred thousand going in there. Which, yeah. to your question, we need two point eight, two point nine, three even more in there to continue to, to maintain the, the assets in this town. So um, this is more, the million is more than we, I think, got them to agree to during the budget process. So right. we are, I think we're heavy 300 or 500,000 in that space. But you're right, Chris, it is very complicated. I, I would also point out the 15% is something that they have discussed, but I don't think they have formalized that as a metric. Yeah. Um, and no. even that is a, could be a debated point. So it is. Yeah. And it was debated, and uh, bond council and our financial advisor was at the board of finance meeting, right. and we um, are right smack in the middle of the median for towns from a general fund standpoint. They they spent uh, what 15 minutes telling us basically. Obviously, we know from a management side we we score phenomenally well. We score phenomenally well from a uh, a fiscal policy side, we score phenomenally well from a demographic side, which again all accounts to our AAA bond rating. Right. And they were very comfortable with our 15% our uh, mark. And I know Board of Finance members kind of debate that round and round. They also um, very, very um, diplomatically but strongly recommended that we, we do fund as much as possible this capital reserve type fund. Um, again, we can't call these funds, nor should we call them um, mill rate relief funds. No, no, we can't. No, debt, debt service funds. Excuse me. We can <laughs> right. call them mill rate relief funds. <laughs> and again, so, and again as, as the Board of Finance said at the meeting, and again, it was a three and a half hour meeting, I'll spare you all of the details, um, they can transfer this money back out yep. at mm -hmm. our request um, anytime we need to. So this money is by no means sunk yeah. or gone anywhere, but it, it, it's an appropriate uh, tool to have there. And again, it should be higher. And again, you know, with the challenges that we have coming down the road from a cash for capital standpoint. Yep. Um, I'm excited can I just about ask this. a quick question? Um, when you were talking about the cushion due to the actuarial changes, did you account for the discussion we were having on lowering the assumption rate on the pension returns? Yes. So that's already factored into that. Yes. So I just want to make sure we're not going to come back and have nope. to do that on top of it. Yeah. I mean, whether three to six hundred thousand dollars is enough, that's another question, but that is what it's. And what is the what is the rate that you are assuming for the next fiscal year? What did we go down to six seven six five? seven five? And we wanted to so work then to six, the five. recommendation would probably to go down to six, six five, five. But depending yeah. on how the actual numbers come back at the accrued um, the five percent increase in the accrued liability, mm -hmm. we'll have to look at that then and see how much cushion there is. Thank we'll you. just have to make sure that we explain diligently to the board of finance who can't seem to comprehend that the four three wasn't actually our recommended budget with those type of changes. We were scolded numerous times by the Board of Finance for the 4-3 increase, which wasn't actually accurate. Mm -hmm. a, a, a port, did at least a, a, half, a point and a half of that 4-3 was the Board of Finance making changes and otherwise. So, what we I just wanted to say one more thing on the million, too, is um, the million really should be put aside, whether it be for mill rate relief or some sort of relief in the capital nature, um, because the majority of that million is that bond premium. Right. Mm -hmm. So in all reality, we had a great, great um, um, outcome when, with the bond issuance when we got 1.64%. But our reality is we got that bond premium because we're paying 1.64%. I'm sorry, we're paying out in actuality 1.64%. But our coupon that we're paying out to the investors, if you will, is anywhere from 4 to 5%. So they're basically offsetting between 1.64% and that 4 to 5% is your bond premium. Mm -hmm. So coming out of the general fund for your debt service payments is four to five percent. Mm -hmm. Other questions? 
The only other thing from the, the, the Board of Finance meeting, they did um, attempt to change the collection rate again, but after further thought, they decided best not to. Um, and they, they didn't, we, we explained um, that we did not re uh, reject their request to transfer the money um, as they talked about the budget season that we emphasized again, it was tabled in the event that it's needed at the end of the year. But given the fiscal performance we've seen, we're very hopeful that we'll continue to enjoy excess revenues and that transfer would be unnecessary. Yeah. But Amy and Maria and uh, Melissa did an outstanding job uh, talking the Board of Finance through these uh, these issues for a good three and a half hours. <laughs> well done. Um, any other questions for Amy? Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion uh, effective September 23rd, 2019 to approve the year-end transfer requests as presented? So moved. Second. Any further conversation? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Um, moving on to appointments and resignations, uh, is there a motion to accept uh, with our thanks the resignation of Tom Frank as a regular member of the Board of Education retroactive to September 11th, 2019? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And um, item B is a proposed appointment. So the Democratic Town Committee is recommending uh, the appointment of Sharon Thomas to the Board of Ed. Sharon, I uh, believe... Uh, I believe most of us have met you. I did um, <laughs> want to ask if you wanted to just say a few words of introduction. So hi to everyone who doesn't know me. Um, I'm Sharon Thomas, and I've lived in town um, since at least early 2000. And, um, you know, I'm honored to have been recommended and um, have to gone through the process and I'm excited to be on the Board of Ed. Um, as some know, I don't have any children, um, but I'm still um, excited to represent the kids, the children of our town and those who come into our town um, and hope to serve well um, with advocating for them and, you know, and also maintaining that we um, for budgetary and, and those related items that we work along with the finance committee. So happy to have been nominated or appointed and happy to have accepted. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to approve the appointment of Sharon Thomas as a regular member of the Simsbury Board of Education, effective September 23rd, 2019, with the term expiring November 5th, 2019, and further to appoint Sharon Thomas as a regular member of the Simsbury Board of Education effective November 6th, 2019, with a term expiring on December 6th, 2021. So moved. So moved. Oh, second. Any further conversation? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Yay. Congratulations, Yay. Sharon. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you for Thank serving. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for stepping up. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Next is a review of the minutes from our last meeting on September 9th. Is there any proposed changes to the meeting minutes? Okay, then they'll stand. Any uh, liaison and subcommittee reports? Um, I have a couple. Uh, first, I lost my piece of paper. Um, on October 28th, the Aging and Disability Commission will be presenting sensory-friendly Halloween. Um, we would like to invite all families who might have a child who is um, sensory um, sensitive. <laughs> sensory sensitive, that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, would like to have a friendly and supportive Halloween environment in which to trick or treat from door to door and have sensory friendly costumes and treats and games and it should be a wonderful event. And um, we would, I think there's more information on the Aging and Disability website, and if you'd like to pre-register, that would be great, so we can plan on, on how many families will be attending. Um, the other thing is uh, the Community for Care on November 6th will be holding a program in um, coordinating with uh, the program we heard about earlier tonight, Resilience Grows Here, and other veterans organizations to focus on the mental health needs of veterans in our town. Um, this is the first time we have devoted a program exclusively to veterans, um, and we are doing it in celebration, you know, ahead of Veterans Day. Um, there are other veterans events going on in town um, during November, so I would encourage you to 
attend, support our veterans, and if you have a veteran in your family or you are a veteran, um, we invite you to come and attend the program, and hopefully we will provide useful information. Great. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, and the Community for Care uh, this week uh, will be holding its first meeting of the Spirit Council, which is the um, council which was formed after the Community Diversity <coughs> Forum we held in May. So we are looking forward to welcoming our moderator from the Department of Justice back to town to help us get that committee going. And that will be this Thursday at the library. Great. Thank you. Any other? Sean. Just two quick ones uh, to follow up on your uh, first selectman's report. Uh, the Public Safety Subcommittee met last week, and we did, uh, uh, at the end of uh, the meeting, it was a rather robust meeting, have uh, a discussion about the uh, wildlife, uh, uh, we keep calling it the feeding ordinance, the please don't feed the wildlife. Yes. <laughs> um, and again, there was uh, there was unanimous consent to form uh, yet another subcommittee because we didn't want to... Uh, <laughs> We didn't want to utilize the 15 members of, of the public safety subcommittee in that in that format. So, Chris, <laughs> myself, Maria, uh, the chief, and I believe Gary Wilcox are, are going to to meet, and uh, we, uh, at the direction of the subcommittee, are going to uh, have a draft ordinance ready for the next um, public safety meeting, which hopefully uh, will be then forwarded to this group. So we're looking to, to move that along uh, quickly. Right. Um, we're also, I believe, trying to coordinate through uh, for, uh, the town manager's office uh, another meeting with Deep. And Maria, of course, has, is well ahead of the rest of us and is already researching um, other municipalities and ordinances so that we uh, will be in good shape to deliver. Um, I, once again, just one final note on the uh, Board of Finance meeting last week. Again, it was a really, really robust meeting. And for those that didn't, didn't uh, hang in there to the end, um, we, we did have all the discussions previously. But in the beginning, uh, there was a, a, a spirited uh, and thoughtful discussion with both town attorney and bond council on the prior uh, issue that was raised by uh, our town manager and finance director in terms of who approves debt um, and how that all works and the parameters. Uh, to, summar to summarize, I think the Board of Finance um, is in a good place from an understanding standpoint, and I believe our board is as well, that really there's no there's no change to practice. It's just a matter of who signs off at the, at the end. There is some flexibility with, with perhaps we could go in a different direction. Um, than the Board of Finance would want us to. We would have to do that um, knowing full well that there could be challenges in the in the future budget year. Um, but again, we, we are the final authority in terms of issuing debt. However, we cannot go out and bond for 20 years if the Board of Finance has 10 years. Um, and and the, there's some pretty substantial parameters. So at, at the end of the day, I think the, the chairman and the rest of the board was, was comfortable that the Board of Selectmen is not going to go run off and incur a bunch of debt that um, is not uh, not in that is not consistent with the town's debt policy or obviously with our ability to pay it back so thank you we're uh, done with that issue okay any other subcommittee Sean I'm shocked you didn't bring up public safety in the recent re-rash of, of uh, car thefts due to your favorite topic I'm behaving myself yeah. but uh, oh I, I forgot another meeting I, I, I could <laughs> oh, it, as, as Chris prompted me uh, there's been a, a substantial uptick again in, um, I'm not even going to call them break-ins, in opening unlocked car doors. That have um, keys in them. That have keys in them. So that, to be clear, there have been no actual breaking. There's been just <laughs> entering. Um, and every single vehicle that's been stolen, I've confirmed with the chief, has been stolen because the keys have been in the vehicle. <laughs> Um, there was even a homeowner where one vehicle was stolen from down the road. That vehicle was ditched in front of another house where both garage doors were open and both vehicles had their cars in it or keys in it. Those vehicles were not taken, thankfully, because the, the juveniles that were involved um, went to another community. But once again, please lock your damn cars and take your keys out of them. <laughs> I get. Them. I knew I'd get them going. <laughs> <laughs> please, it's a waste of the police department's time, and more importantly, and in all seriousness, if the police department has to engage in pursuit, we're putting lives at risk here. Either the the children that are involved here, these are juveniles, other residents that are driving around, the officers themselves. This is not an area where we want to engage in pursuit, but the officers will obviously do what they need to do to protect life and property. Let's not put anybody in danger by leaving our keys in the car, please. Thank you. Thank you for that public service, Sean. Um, anything One more. else? Oh, Cheryl, sorry, sorry. Then I'll stop. Um, the 350 committee, and Tara can help me out with this if you want. But um, 
If you volunteered to help the 350 committee online or at our event at September Fest, um, you should have gotten an invitation to the next steering committee meeting on October 3rd at 6.30 p.m. at the library. If you're listening to this and you did not hear from somebody regarding um, that meeting, um, you are welcome to attend. Um, we would also welcome anyone else who is interested in volunteering um, to come to that steering committee meeting to meet the committee chairs, hear more about the activities and volunteer opportunities available. Are those, um, thank you, are, the, are your You're steering welcome. committee meetings uh, re regular and set or are they? They are, somewhat we are a public meeting, we have agendas there. No, yeah, but, but is there a, a reoccurrence, uh, is it that the first what, something in? There is not, Mo no, okay. Okay. so. Thank you. Um, we had been meeting, um, I think it was every two weeks for a while, but that it turned out to not be necessary okay. as we got a little more organized. So um, now we are going to hopefully start on a, another fixed schedule. Calendar, so okay. We, yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Are there any items under communication that anyone wanted to bring up? Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss so three items? <laughs> I gotta get there. Second. A tax stabilization. <laughs> We got to read this into the record, folks. Okay, okay. All right. A, ta a tax stabilization request from the developer of the Tobacco Valley Solar Project. Two, a discussion of a possible purchase of property. And three, the discussion of a possible lien related to Connecticut's Uniform Relocation Act. We'll be joined on all three items by our town manager, Maria Capriola, Deputy Town Manager, Melissa Appleby, and Attorney Bob DiCrescenzo. Finance <laughs> Director, Amy Merriweather, and Assessor Francine Boland will join for item number one. Planning Director Mike Glidden will join for items one and two. No. We did that. Chris yeah. made the motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. We're all you got set. <laughs>